Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Quainstein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to have with us Robert Swan. Robert is a uh, polar pioneer. He is the first person that uh, walked to both the uh, the North and the South Pole. He is awarded the uh, Polar Medal by Queen Elizabeth, and uh, he has just an incredible life story, and uh, he's a internationally known speaker and uh, speaks on the subject of leadership, and uh, he has some great uh, life lessons that he's going to share with us. He has a couple TED Talks also that uh, uh, please check out, and uh, looking forward to today's conversation with Robert. Well, Robert, we were introduced uh, not too long ago. Uh, a CEO, uh, person I know, has uh, out in California introduced me to you and said that you'd come in and given a talk to his team, and he s- said some great things about you. And uh, I think you're the first person with, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what title uh, to give you. So when you're at a dinner party, what, when they ask you, what do you do, what, uh, what's your reply? Well, I, I would say po- probably a rather facetious reply would be that I'm the first person in history, which I am, but I'd add in the word stupid enough to walk to the North and South Poles. I, I would imagine that's, that's how I would introduce myself. Well, talk about, uh, and we're going to go through kind of your journey. Uh, and we, we talked uh, earlier and we said your kind of your story is in different acts. Uh, you know, if you look at a play, it, it, you have different uh, acts and scenes. And uh, for those that are typically listening to this podcast, uh, we also are going to be sharing some photos uh, throughout this, uh, this talk today in our conversation. Uh, so definitely check out our website for the video version as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, to see, uh, I guess, get the full impact. And a picture is worth a thousand words. And uh, so we definitely want to share those uh, today. But start back kind of at the beginning. Uh, we've got a great picture of you at uh, 11 years old. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, your journey as you started well, out. I think that picture of me when I was 11 was probably the last time I was properly dressed, Mark, and <laughs> right. certainly the last time I had some hair. <laughs> but this began literally a very normal English upbringing in the north of England. And I watched this film on Christmas Day when I was 11 about the real explorers who went to the South and North Pole, you know, Scott, Shackleton, Peary, Amundsen, all these incredible people. And literally I looked at it and said, right, I will become the first person to walk to both poles. And People have laughed at me ever since about that, and they still laugh, Mark. But guess what? In between, we actually achieved that mission. And it began very early on, and somehow I hung on to that that dream. That was Act One, the decision. So talk a little bit about uh, you you made the decision at at 11, uh, and you talk a little bit of how that dream developed and uh, you know, you didn't just arrive at your first expedition. There was a lot of stuff that went into that and a lot of uh, pain that went, uh, went into that. Talk a little bit about that. Well, a huge amount, you know, because I, I wasn't an explorer. I wasn't uh, uh, come from a, ba- a family background of mountaineers and things. You know, my great grandfather was the, one of the founders of KPMG, Sir William mm. Pete of the P. So, you know, it was a bit of a shock to people when suddenly I was saying on a walk to both poles, people were quite shocked. And it it was really a question of saying, okay, if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. And I was very lucky to be number seven, the youngest in the family. And all my brothers and sisters said, look, Rob, if you're going to talk about this for the rest of your life, which I was, you know, just get it going, start it. And I think that was a really sound piece of advice. There's so many people out there with dreams. I had a dream, but I was inspired to just get it going. So I went to university to keep my parents happy, um, (laughs) get a proper job, Rob, was something they still say. 
Uh, my mum, mum's 105 now and she wow. still says, Rob, when are you going to get a proper job? <laughs> but uh, I started it and I went to London. I live in the north of England or not now, but I'm in California, but went to London, I hired a small little section of a warehouse and thought, you know, I can raise five million, which it would cost uh, to go to the South Pole. I could do it in a month. Mm. Um, no. And I was on my own and I had a job driving taxis on the streets of London at night. And in the day I'd put the shirt and tie on and go and see people, Mark, and every single person for five years said, no, mm. we won't support you, Rob, because you're going to go there and die. And the only sponsor I had in five years was a very generous company that sent me 2000 cans of beer, which promptly I drank because <laughs> you know, I was pretty upset after five sure. years of battling. And I think that what I learned in those ups and downs is that you have to listen carefully as to why people say no to your idea, to your dream. And you listen with respect and you don't get upset. And gradually, if you listen to all the reasons why people are saying no, you'll start to get yeses. and it took seven years of my life to raise that five million, buy a ship, and then head off south to the Antarctic from London. Mm. So talk a little bit, um, you know, when we, we talk today, we think of, you know, going and exploring and, you know, all of us have a little device that equals uh, any supercomputer that uh, probably back then uh, but you couldn't just put ways in, go uh, get a map or uh, your GPS on your uh, your phone or device. Uh, talk a little bit about that. It kind of when you you know started out on your trek. It was it was quite extraordinary. You know, we arrived in Antarctic on a ship. We were dropped off, and we lived for nine months. Five of us mm. talk about isolation in a hut, and then three of us stood literally on the edge of Antarctica. The South Pole's 900 nautical miles away, distance like Chicago to New York. Mm. And we're aiming for one building in the size, in an area twice the size of Australia. And the building's the South Pole Station. And if we miss it, we're dead. But we have no radio because they didn't work. We have no communications, no GPS, nothing, not a thing. So we have to navigate pretty much like Scott and Shackleton and Amundsen. We navigated using the sun, mm. a sextant and a watch. And we must be on target. So it was hugely, hugely isolation. It, it just brought in that sense of isolation that the real explorers must have had. You know, either you get there or you don't come home. Yeah, and we've got some pictures we're uh, showing of of uh, you guys arriving and, and getting there. And uh, talk a little bit about just some of the lessons learned during that, uh, that well, expedition. I think, I think that a lot of us at the moment still are facing this, this thing of feeling trapped in with people. And imagine being in a hut for nine and a half months with four people that don't like you and you don't like them because I chose really different strong characters to make this expedition a success. So throughout those journeys, we learned that really it's a good idea to tell each other the truth. Don't come with, up with a whole lot of bullshit because eventually it's going to surface anyhow. So try and tell the truth. Try and listen, especially if, as a leader. Listen to what people are really saying to you. Not what you want to hear, but listen to what they're saying. And most importantly, before you want to kill each other, which we often did, try and use humor to diffuse a potentially very angry situation. Use humor to kind of level things out. And we use that on the journey. Imagine being in a tent with two other people for 70 days wow. and you can just fit in like sardines. So I think that idea of dealing with isolation, dealing with people that are difficult, and I'm possibly a very difficult person, trust. You know, if you don't trust each other on a journey like this, you're going to die. 
because you have to really trust each other's judgment. And I think I learned that I really need to trust myself, which possibly I'd never done before properly. And if I trusted me, then maybe other people might trust me. And I think the other one, uh, you know, was, was to make sure that there was a sense of belief because Mark, imagine day one, you have 900 miles to go. Your sledge weighs 360 pounds. Every expert had said, if you're attempting the longest unassisted march ever made on the planet, you're going to fail, you're going to die. And on day one, you do three miles. Mm. And you've got to average 12. And on that day, you think, I can't do this. Mm. But you've got to hang on to that belief that you can and knock the thing down. And I learned this, you know, on a big issue, which you don't think you can do, knock it down a bit. Take it day by day, step by step. So you, you get to the get to the pole, you celebrate for a couple minutes, and then tell me what happens next. Well, imagine we'd spoken to no one for a year. No iPhone 12 to ring up mummy, right? <laughs> so we get to the pole, we're standing there, at far south as you can go on the planet. It was a hell of a moment, I tell you. Um, we'd done it. And out from the South Pole Scientific Station came the base commander, crying and i thought you know americans are a bit emotional but what's wrong with this guy and he said rob i can't believe i'm telling you this that your ship southern quest sank was crushed by ice and sank five minutes ago hmm. not five hours or five days but five minutes ago so this was a massive massive moment and actually it wasn't that hard because everybody was safe and that's all that counted but I'd made a promise, Mark, a, a promise to my patron, uh, uh, the great Jacques Cousteau from France. I hope some of the listeners will know who I mean. Possibly one of the, the, the first environmental leaders for the ocean. And he gave me credibility. And anybody's listening who's trying to get something going in life, you know that when somebody gives you some credibility, it's a big thing. Uh, but he asked in return for that, he said, Rob, when you leave Antarctica, take away all your garbage and equipment, leave the last great wilderness clean and tidy. I said, we'll do it. Get on the phone and help me raise some money. So the crunch comes when we're standing at the pole. I've lost the ship. It's 3,000 miles back to New Zealand. I don't have a ship and I've got 60 tons of equipment in Antarctica. So I thought, damn it, we made a promise, cut a long story short, it took an extra year, it took huge sacrifice by people to spend another year in Antarctica, but eventually we did that job, mm. and we left Antarctica tidy, and I'm proud of that. So you, you get to that, that point, and I, I'm sure you, know, you felt like you had accomplished a lot, but then you had the the challenge or the difficulty, and I, I know we've got uh, entrepreneurs that uh, listen to the podcast, and yeah. and they're probably trying to build something. And and we got uh, smacked with uh, with COVID stuff, got shut down, and and uh, so you know what it's like to to work through kind of that uh, uh, time of crisis and time where you don't have really a, a roadmap to kind of navigate. Um, but talk a little bit about any other lessons that you learned during that that crisis moment. Well, I think first is that, you know, you stick to the damn plan. Um, because I think to gain credibility, and I was literally an entrepreneur of walking to both poles, not that it made any bloody money, excuse the language, but, you know, it, I was an entrepreneur. And what was I trying to do? I was trying to make sure that I built track record, Mark, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many words in this world, and I think that if, if you think carefully before you make commitments for your life, for your business, for, for our world, you should do them. Because if you don't, you don't have track record. Mm. 
Mm. So however crazy your ideas might be, like walking to the North and South Pole is a bit stupid, really. But people, if you build track record, will listen to you. They won't if you're somebody that just does this and never does what you say sure. you're going to do. So I learned that. And I learned that I wasn't on my own, where I felt like I was on my own. Guess what? 28 years old, walked to the South Pole, lost 69 pounds in body weight, so we were a bit messed up. And suddenly I've got a 1.2 million US dollar debt. And that's a lot of money today. Imagine that sure. 30 years ago. And I've got to pay it off. But rather than feeling alone, I, I was able to pull in the people who'd helped me before and they helped me again. And I helped myself to fight our way out of that debt. And, and then for some really stupid reason, decided it was time to go to the North Pole. Not the best financial decision I've ever made, I might say. <laughs> Well, talk a little bit about that. You, you've got a new, uh, how long did it take you to, to prepare for that, uh, well, that it, trek? It, it, it was, that was the dream, to do both poles, to become the first to walk to both poles. And, you know, being rather a, a poor business person, while I was paying off the debts, I thought, hang on a minute, maybe if we're going to be raising money to go to the North Pole, I can not just only reach the North Pole with the team, but I can pay off the debts at the same time. This was not the best decision I ever made financially. But I think I learned something, regardless of having you know, increased my debts, that I learned something that you've got to keep the momentum going in life. You know? You've got to keep the momentum going with your business, your plan. No one's really interested in what happened before. They're interested in what's happening now. And if suddenly you left five, 10 years between both poles, everybody would have forgotten. So within three years, we'd picked up the ball and eight of us from seven nations now uh, go to the North Pole, which is a whole different game. It's ice mm. on the surface of an ocean. So it can break, you can fall into the sea. The South Pole was ice on land, right. ice up to 16,000 feet. So. We now head north from the edge of the continent of you know, North America, Canada, onto a frozen ocean. And we're gonna walk every single step away from the safety of land into the middle of this, what we hope will be a frozen ocean. Uh, eight of us from seven different nations, lots of different issues about nationalities and language and patience and all kinds of you know, new lessons that we learned on the way to the north. So you're, you're on this track and you're, you're into it. Uh, how long? I know there was some challenges. All of a sudden you're facing something that wasn't, uh, you know, most leadership is not life and death, but uh, you've, you've had some close calls. Ta talk well, a little bit about what you, what you experienced. This was appalling because, you know, I, I do not like walking to the poles. I can think of a hell of a lot of better things to do in my life than be at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit walking nine hours a day across rough ice. You know, it's not fun. And we're so nearly there. We're 100 miles from the North Pole after 900 to the south, 600 to the north and 100 to go. And I'm thinking, yes, we got this. And remember, we're on this frozen sea. And in the middle of the night, we're all lying there and suddenly the whole tent goes and it twists and jars underneath mm. us. And, and we think this is, this is like going to, be, going to be a serious time. And it was. The whole ocean around us now breaks up into smaller sections of ice, smaller and smaller and smaller, where 100 miles from the North Pole, no one knows where we are. Um, we, all we have is a beacon that we set off when we hopefully get to the North Pole and an aeroplane will come and get us. We didn't want to set off that beacon 100 miles away, so we have a big fight through this breaking ice, ice beneath our feet. And I think what I learned, actually, which is a bit sad in life to know who you really are, 
And in my case, it's quite limited, really, that I'm not an explorer. You know, Scott Shackleton Armandson was were explorers. I'm not. And I'm too stupid, sadly, to be a scientist. And I'm certainly not an environmentalist. I'm not qualified. But what I realized when the ice was breaking up around us, Mark, that I was pretty good at staying alive, <laughs> that I was a survivor, and that it, we had to march 40 hour days because it's always daylight at the North Pole in summer, and 24 hours work wasn't enough. So we, we have a huge battle to get to the North Pole. Some people don't even still speak to me now, but at least they're still alive. And we got, we, we reached the North Pole and it, it was a great moment. And just as an aside, you know, you can't walk to the North Pole now anymore, 30 years on, because there is no ice. So what we experienced 30 years ago, you know, we didn't know what was happening, but it was the beginning of the Arctic Ocean turning back into an ocean permanently, which it nearly has. Hmm. So you you get to uh, the the end of that uh, that journey, and so you know what what else could you do? I mean, what what else uh, could could you possibly dream up? And well, you know something, and I hope that I might be helpful to people that are going through that time of really setting something up and putting all they have into doing it. Ladies and gentlemen listening, you're going to achieve, you're going to achieve this. But mark my words when I say that often it's quite hard to achieve what you've dreamed of doing. And standing at the North Pole, I was really glad to have done it. I was never going to walk anywhere ever again in, in, indefinitely but it felt quite empty because I'd spent all that time to make sure. this happen. And I felt very empty and I felt very low. And <clears throat> I hope it's not embarrassing to say, cause it's not to me, but I found myself, you know, for about a year drinking too much because I couldn't face this hole inside me, which I seem to, it hurt. It, it, it got to me and I was lucky. It wasn't me that dreamed up the next act. It was Jacques Cousteau. And I went to go and see Jacques Cousteau and he didn't say, you know, he's a Frenchman. He didn't say, Oh, Robert, well done. You know, walking <laughs> he just looked at me and he said, what are you doing young man for the next 50 years? Mm. And at that moment I knew that, I'd found my next mission because I am a mission type of person. And he said to me in the year 2041, and remember this was in 1991, the treaty that preserves Antarctica and leaves it alone for us all. Antarctica is the only place in the world, Mark, that we all own. No one owns it. Hmm. In 2041, he said, Rob, make sure that we have the sense to leave one place alone on earth forever, Antarctica, as a natural reserve land for science and peace. And I took that with, you know, an enormously big hug because this was what, you know, moved me on, you know, from that day until now, I've never drunk anything. Uh, mm. But that hole in me, I'll never forget. It was a difficult time. And um, we've been working for Antarctica now for 30 years. And we got 20 years to go until the magic year 2041, when we all must decide on the future of this beautiful continent. Talk a little bit as, as you uh, have gone through as far as kind of that next, uh, next act as you've put together kind of uh, you know, teams and groups from around the world and, and talk about that of what, what you're doing. Well, I think that, you know, as with anybody, especially, you know, ladies and gentlemen, entrepreneurs, that, you know, you, you think you've got there. You know, I was the first person to walk to both poles. It's a pretty big thing to have done. I'm mean, even in the Guinness Book of Records, you know, the Queen of England's given me lots of things for having done it. You know, a lot of people would say, well, okay, you know, I've done that. I'll write some books and, you know, talk about it. And I thought, no, that's just the beginning. Mm. And, 
in order to preserve Antarctica, uh, with no budget, by the way, no one gives me any money. Jack Cousteau promptly died, so I didn't have him to help me. And I thought there will be two ways to do this. And we've been working on this for 30 years. One, to engage and inspire young people across the world from I think we've we've been, we've got to like 83 or four different nations and how would one inspire them by taking young leaders and occasionally the odd old leader like me down to Antarctica and we go every year uh, we're going in this November and we go down just for a couple of weeks uh, to learn about leadership and teamwork and sustainability and energy and the Antarctic and those people go back home as champions to preserve Antarctica so that's one way the other way was to think okay why would people go to Antarctica they go there for energy for fossil fuels for uh, for, for resources so I thought to myself, and I'm a bit slow, but I kind of get there in the end. I thought, hang on a minute. If I could help us in the real world use more renewable, clean energy, use different types of fuels and biofuels and alternative fuels and synthetic fuels, wind power, solar power, all of that. If we can get that to scale, Mark, here, guess what? In 20 years time, KPMG will save Antarctica. It'll be a bunch of accountants that do it. Why? Because they'll look at some balance sheet and just say, it's not worth going there financially per barrel of oil, per ton of gas, because we've got cheaper energy and it's clean back here in the real world. So we've worked really, really hard on the whole idea of testing, showcasing, uh, renewable technologies, uh, especially in some very, very harsh environments. So talk about, you know, you've, you've done uh, the exploring, you've gone back and uh, talk about just some of the other things. Your, your, your story's not done. Uh, you've got some more uh, trekking to do and, and things that, uh, that happen that most people wouldn't want to go through, but uh, talk about that. Well, I think, again, it, it comes back to remember the momentum. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I've been privileged to know some very you know, outstanding English actors um, in my life. And all of them have given me that little piece of advice to say, Rob, you're only as good as your last film or your last play. You've got to keep the momentum going. So especially on the renewable energy side, now, I, I had no intention whatsoever of walking anywhere ever again. I made that clear when I reached the North Pole in 1989. However, enter my son, Barney, mm -hmm. who's a radically different character than me. I'm, you know, a bulldozer that never says no and just keeps going rather annoying to everybody. But Barney's sort of like everything I should be. You know, he's sensitive. He's quite spiritual he um you know really really engages with the outdoors you know i'll be happy just to sit inside next to a warm stove for the rest of my life <laughs> and you know he had a bit of a battle being my son it's not easy to be the son of some idiot like me so he came through and he just said to me about four years ago he said dad we've got to go to the south pole again and you've got to come with me. I'm sick and tired of being Rob Swan's son. I'd like to do my own thing in life and establish my own credibility. Will you come with me and walk to the South Pole? And I said, no, absolutely <laughs> no. And he said, but dad, what happens if we did this together only on renewable energy? And I said, okay, what route are we doing? And he showed me the route and I said, well, actually, no, you know something, Bonnie, if we make this journey, it's only si only 600 miles. And if we make it together, it'll be the first ever expedition only to survive on renewable energy. Great for the 2041 story. But also, if I make it, 
I will have crossed the whole of the Antarctic landmass in my lifetime. And I thought, yeah, keeps the story going, keeps it relevant. So I agreed to do it with him. And it was incredible technology from NASA, uh, who helped us build these incredible ice melting machines. One day they'll use them on Mars. And we off we went together. And you know something? I think it's so important that generations join together for any mission. You know, you can't have people of my generation, people of a younger generation not working together. And I, and I it was just fantastic to set off with my son to the South Geographic Pole, only 600 miles. I got it in the bag. It's nothing for a person that's walked to both poles. So I thought, Mark. And after 300 miles out of the 600, my left hip just says enough and it disintegrates while I'm walking. I can't move and I face failure. I've got to come out and I have failed in everything in life, but I'd never failed to get to the pole when I said I would. And I'm leaving my son at 23 to fight on. You know, this was just terrible. And I had to deal with failure, and I'd never dealt with it before in that department. And it, it was awful. But Barney fought on, reached the South Pole, and it was wonderful to be able to just go in with my crutches to the South Pole and celebrate his moment. Nothing to do with me. He'd done it, not me. And that was just a very, very special feeling that I didn't matter much anymore. What mattered that it was the mission and he'd achieved that. So that was a bit of up and down at that stage, Mark, but it was a great moment, but bloody painful, I have to say, on the old hip. <laughs> but that's not the, uh, the end of the story. And uh, the story continues. Uh, Unfortunately, yes. I, 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 this is where the psychiatric help may have to come in. So if anybody <laughs> knows a good person that can help. that, As you might imagine, I have to look at a map of Antarctica. And it's my joy to look at a map of Antarctica every day of my life. I'm trying to help preserve it. But I didn't want to look at, look at a map of Antarctica thinking there's only 300 miles left to reach the South Pole to cross the Antarctic. So I got my new hip put in and went back exactly this time last year to finish that 300 miles. And again, I thought, I've got this. It's 300 miles. It's nothing. And it was fantastic. I had two brilliant leaders, Johanna and Katinka from Norway, uh, two of the top class polar explorers in the world, uh, joined by our brilliant cameraman from Norway, and off we went to the South Pole those last 300 miles. And it was just fantastic. It was the first time I'd ever enjoyed walking to any pole, <laughs> led by two fantastic women who just knew how to do it, and it was just great. 150 miles in. 200 miles in and I'm thinking I've got this 97 miles from the pole it's nothing and I took my focus off I started thinking about what it would be like to reach the pole not what was I not what I was doing at that moment got out of the tent tripped over a piece of ice because I wasn't thinking and my brand new hip that had done so well, 200 odd miles, blew out of its socket. Mm. And I'm left lying there in the snow crying and feeling extremely sorry for myself, I have to say. Because when you go, and any entrepreneur knows this, that when you go to the South Pole, you don't just go back. You've got to raise half a million dollars to go and do it again. So I got back home. You mentioned it. And I was feeling pretty sorry for myself, actually. And then COVID hit the very month we got back. And I'm a public speaker, international public speaker. And the public went and the international bit went. The business went to zero, nothing. Mm -hmm. 
and I've got a hip that's half fallen out. And I thought, hang on a minute, this is not over yet. And at the age of 65, I'm going back at the end of this year to finish those last 97 miles. And then I thought, no, this is a bit boring. You know, old English guy putting a flag in at the South Pole. It doesn't mean much. But I thought, what could I do to make it a better, more relevant story? So I pulled together a brilliant team of wounded veterans from the United States of America, uh, women and men that have lost limbs for their nations, uh, nation um, in war. And they'll join me for those last miles. We'll get to the pole and I hope have a great story of doing what you say you're going to do and having a little bit of resilience. Mm. And then, only then, I can bring my skis back home. You know, Mark, how people say they'll hang their skis up. I'm going to get a very large drill with some very big bolts and bolt the skis to the wall because they're not coming down again. It's time for some warmer weather from now on. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah I, you know, your your journey, and we're going to put some information available to kind of how people find out more about uh, this this next uh, venture. Uh, but uh, talk a little bit about you know outside of exploring, and I'm sure you you mentioned warmer climates. Uh, so w- when you're not uh, trekking through ice and snow, uh, what do you do to to recharge? Well, I remember I'm an Englishman but I live in California. I don't live in California just for the view. I live in California because it's nice weather. Mm. So looking out today, I see, um, you know, beautiful blue sky. I was on Skype, uh, not Skype, Zoom with my mum this morning. I said, she's 105. And I said, mum, turn the camera around. Let me see the weather. And it's completely gray and pouring with rain. So <laughs> I, I enjoy good weather. And I live in California. Uh, I live up in the mountains uh, near Lake Tahoe. And I do an awful lot of road cycling. Mm. That's my passion. Because when you get to my age and you've smashed yourself up as much as I have, cycling is really good because there's no pressure on your joints and hips and back and all of that. I am not much of a walker, I have to say. Um, I've taken up don't laugh, Um, much to the inspiration of my son Barney, I've taken up stretching. I tried yoga, but it was such a joke. It wasn't funny to go to a yoga class. So I'm I'm taking up solo stretching, which is a whole new thing for me, uh, which I'm enjoying actually, I have to say. Um, Cycling, um, stretching now, uh, a little bit of, weight weight work not high big weights but uh, mm. obviously you know i've got to make it this time it's 97 miles to the pole and i'll be with a team which you know it's hard enough doing it on one leg these guys and girls will be doing it sorry on two legs they'll be doing it on one leg so i've got to make sure i'm there uh, they'll probably be supporting me knowing them and i very much enjoy the ocean and that's really the next mission that, you know, in, in three years time, it's only going to be closing in on 15 years to go until 2041. So I'm launching in three years a voyage on a, on a yacht around the world to go and inspire young people, old people, governments, businesses, whoever it is, over a 10 year mission to go to as many countries as I can to get people behind the preservation of the Antarctic landmass. I'm going to take lots of tips from you, Mark, because I'm hoping to do a few podcasts from our yacht as we go Mm. and really smash it in to get people behind the preservation of the Antarctic. And then those last five years where I'll be sort of pushing 80, um, I'll be spending time hopefully running a good campaign because we've just got one chance you know one continent left one chance to do it and a lot of people probably listening are thinking well what do you think will happen rob well i think what will happen 
if we're not careful, is a bunch of bureaucrats will go behind closed doors and make some decisions about Antarctica, which don't look too threatening at the time. They'll say, well, you know, we can increase a bit more fishing or we can allow some exploration drilling or something like that. We can't allow that because, as you know, once you start something, it creeps closer and closer and closer to what you don't want to happen. So I'm hopeful that in 2041, at the worst, we can get this treaty extended for another 50 years. And then all the young people, hopefully led by my son Barney, will make sure that in you know, 50, 60, 70 years from now, um, the Antarctic's preserved forever. But maybe, maybe. Uh, we could get it preserved forever in 2041. And mm. that's, my, that's my, my goal, Mark. Great. Well, this has been, been a lot of fun to hear your, your journey and lessons learned. And uh, for all those that are kind of earlier in their leadership, uh, I'm sure some of the lessons that you've learned are, are going to be applicable to their own situations. And how would somebody learn more about uh, kind of what you're working on? And we'll have uh, the, the information available on the screen. But well, thank for those you very much. Listen. Thank you very much indeed. I think that, you know, before I tell you about that, I'd just like to say that I think one thing I've learned outside Antarctica as being, you know, somebody who's got to raise a lot of money, keep all the dreams going, Mark, is that if you're the leader and the firepower and the passion behind what you're doing, and you know where you're going, then it's terribly important that you don't just give one big speech to inspire everybody, because you stay motivated, because you're, 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 driving the ship you're running the ship you're on the helm but don't forget the people in the engine room mm. who need i think two words which are important to me sustainable inspiration it's got nothing to do with saving the planet it's got to do with sustaining their inspiration towards the mission and i, I think i've managed to keep things going because i've always tried to do that uh, very kindly to offer <clears throat> for more information people can go on our website which is probably too old-fashioned but we still got one which is uh, 2041 uh, 24 sorry 2041 foundation.org or robertswan.com uh, and you know we're going to Antarctica in November we're always looking for young leaders uh, old leaders to come with us for a couple of weeks if you'd like to visit antarctica and help save it please join us uh, and my son barney will not talk to me for some time if i don't say this please mark is that i've joined this very annoying thing called instagram where you know all of this <laughs> right um and i've no idea what it does but barney said dad if you keep going at it you might get millions of followers in 20 years time that might help save Antarctica. So my Instagram is Robert C Swan, Robert C for Charlie Swan. So Barney will now not beat me on the head with a frying pan. <laughs> that. But uh, they're fantastic. And, you know, I live in California um, and I hope, you know, when we've finished our, last journey, the undaunted mission that we're calling it, we might have another chat one day together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wish you continued success uh, with all you're working on and for, uh, for the, the coming the last uh, part of your, your journey with, uh, it sounds like a great, great effort and, and looking forward to, to hearing how that goes. And yeah, stay out of holes and falling down and, you know, I will. Yeah. I will. I'll be thinking about it all the <laughs> yeah. way there. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mark. absolutely. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.